Hello, and welcome to Things We Said Today, our bi-weekly podcast about anything and everything to do with the Beatles, collectively and individually. I'm Alan Kozen, the author of The Beatles from the Cavern to the Rooftop and Got That Something, How the Beatles, I Want to Hold Your Hand, Changed Everything, and with my co-author, Adrian Sinclair, The, po- the McCartney Legacy, Volume 1, 1969-73, and Volume 2 is coming along. I'm joined by my esteemed co-hosts, Ken Michaels, who you know is the host of the syndicated radio show, Every Little Thing, um, and co-host of the Beatles podcast, the solo Beatles podcast, Talk More Talk. And he has his own YouTube channel, Ken Michaels Radio, which is packed with Beatles-related interviews and stuff. So, hello, Ken. Hey, Alan. Good to be here. (laughs) Great to be uh, celebrating Paul again. Yes. And Darren DeVivo, who has been a DJ at WFUV FM 90.7 in the New York area since February 1984, right in time for the 20th anniversary of the Ed Sullivan Show. If you're in not in the vicinity in New York, you can hear him and everything else at WFUV at WFUV.org. Hello, Darren. Hello, Alan. Hello, Ken. Hello, everyone. Okay. Hey, Darren. So today, um, we're going to sort of celebrate Paul's, Paul McCartney, you know, one of the Beatles. Talk about him a lot. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) His name's really James. Anyway, we're going to celebrate Paul's 81st birthday uh, by, we had this idea, Ken had this idea, which we may have modified in the back and forth discussion a little bit of um, we would choose basically our favorite song of his for each of the decades he worked in. Um, You know, and obviously what that means is our favorite song for each of the decades he worked in at the moment we chose the favorite songs, because if you ask us tomorrow, we'll probably have different lists. Um, but, you know, we chose them for whatever reasons we did, which we will explain. And uh, but before we get to that, Ken will give us the news. All right. Thank you, Alan. As we are recording this on Monday, June the 12th. And thanks to Darren here for giving me this information uh, tonight in New York City. At the Town Hall, the Irish Repertory Theater will be presenting a tribute concert to Paul. It's called All My Loving, the lyrics of Paul McCartney. It will feature a star-studded cast performing Paul songs with artists introduced by the poet Paul Muldoon, who collaborated with Paul McCartney, editing his recent lyrics book. That's going on tonight in New York. And also, as we've been reporting as part of the upcoming Tribeca Festival, Paul will be taking place in an interview to promote his new book of early Beatle photos called 1964 Eyes of the Storm, which comes out tomorrow, June the 13th. Uh, Conan O'Brien will be interviewing him on June the 15th. That's this Thursday at the uh, Tribeca Performing Arts Center on Chamber Street in New York. Paul's book, as we've heard, showcases 275 photos of the Beatles from late 1963 and early 1964 when Beatlemania erupted. And the conversation will later air on Conan's podcast, Conan O'Brien Needs a Friend. (laughs) Okay. In addition to being interviewed by Conan O'Brien to promote the new book, Paul will also be interviewed by Academy Award winning actor Stanley Tucci. This will be done at the National Portrait Gallery in London to celebrate their new reopening after much renovation has been done. This is part of its First Look Festival, a series of events and activities for adults, families, young people, and schools aimed to reintroduce the National Portrait Gallery to its visitors this summer. Paul, in fact, will have an exhibit running there of his photos from this book uh, from June the 23rd to October 1st this year. This online event for the interview will be streamed live from the new National Portrait Gallery on Thursday, June 29th at 14 British Standard Time. Tickets for the live stream, and this is off Paul's website, are £10. 
Concessionary rate tickets are available in addition to a new discounted five pound ticket for people aged 30 and under. All ticket holders will have access to a recording of the conversation for a limited time only. Paul and Stanley will not only discuss specific photos and the memories Paul has with them, but also their shared interest in the creative arts and photography, drawing on experiences behind and in front of the camera. A further program of film screenings curated by Paul McCartney and a McCartney-inspired analog photography workshop will also be staged later in the summer. Uh, you can visit npg.org.uk for full program listings and ticket booking details. So hopefully uh, we'll get to maybe see or hear these two main interviews Paul's doing, Conan O'Brien and Stanley Tucci. Some big news concerning Julian Lennon from Variety.com. He will be a host and serve as executive producer for a docuseries on how our surroundings influence the making of art. The series called Inspired will be co-produced with New York-based uh, documentary specialist Cargo Film and Releasing. The show will explore the way new places influence and shape the creative process of contemporary artists. In each episode, Julian will meet top artists to uncover a rich tapestry of inspiring stories and allow the viewer to visit a city, region, or country through their eyes. Julian said, what's so special about this series is getting to know an artist and the culture of a place through a specific lens. This unique relationship an artist has with a certain place that gets their creative juices going. This uh, this is a new entry. Uh, it's a new entry point into both artist and place, which is one of the brilliant strokes of this series. There's no word yet as to when and where the series will air. Now, we've heard about this film in the works on again, off again for a few years now, that being Midas Man, a movie about the Beatles manager, Brian Epstein. There have been changes made over the director for the film, and now a third one has been brought in, as this film is reported to have been finished. The UK director, Joe Stevenson, took over the reign earlier this year from Sarah Sugarman after having created differences and scheduling issues. Jacob Fortune Lloyd, the actor from The Queen's Gambit, stars in this biopic as Brian Epstein. Other than actors to play the four Beatles, the film will have actress Rosie Day to play Scylla Black and Jay Leno to play Ed Sullivan. According to Deadline.com, as is often the case on independent films, it hasn't been plain sailing, but the movie is now in the can and there is bullishness from the producers about the project, its performances, new director, and fall festival prospects. Midas Man charts Epstein's role in the cultural revolution and creative explosion of the 1960s and his sizable yet often unheralded influence on pop music. Hopefully, maybe we'll get to see this in the fall, it looks like. To celebrate the 50th anniversary of George Harrison's Living in the Material World album, it's been made available in Dolby Atmos. Amazon has it for a limited time, but Apple Music has it for an extensive uh, period of time. And also to celebrate the 50th anniversary for the single of Live and Let Die, the anniversary being June the 1st, the song has also been made available in Dolby Atmos for the first time on many platforms. The new mix was done by Giles Martin, and Steve Orchard. Okay, a couple of major passings to take note of. First of all, there is Chaz Newby. Chaz was the bass player in the Beatles for four dates in December of 1960. The Beatles had just returned from their first trip in Hamburg and all the guys came back to England except for their bass player, Stu Sutcliffe, who stayed on in Hamburg. They had four dates booked and they needed a bass player. And that's when Pete Best came to the rescue. And he asked a member of his previous band, the Blackjacks, their guitarist, Chaz Newby, to fill in. Now, Chaz was not their bass player. That actually belonged to Ken Brown, who had a falling out with the Beatles over a show that was done at the Casbah. Chaz had to rehearse with the Beatles and learn the bass. And he filled the bill for those four shows. But perhaps most important, he played their now famous Litherland Town Hall show 
and that was on December 27th of 1960, which has now become a turning point in Beatle history because it was there when it it was like the Beatles were transformed into this great rock and roll band after all the hours and work they put in in Hamburg. And they were also billed as being direct from Hamburg, so some of the people who attended it actually thought that they were German. It's been said that John Lennon asked him if he'd be interested in joining the band for when they returned to Hamburg, but Chaz actually has denied this claim, thinking he wouldn't have asked them to replace his friend Stu. Um, Chaz was actually on break from college at the time, and he had no real aspirations of having a career as a musician. He studied chemical engineering, had a career with that until he retired in 1998. But after that, he taught math at a high school for some time. And in recent years, he actually joined the surviving members of the Quarrymen to play the songs the group did before they were famous. Chaz was 81 when he died. He was actually born on Paul McCartney's birthday, but a year before Paul. And he was also left-handed, yeah. just like Paul. Now, back in 2013, on this show, Things We Said Today, before we had Alan and Al Sussman and now Darren to join us, it was just Steve Marinucci and me doing the show. And we did an interview with Chaz which was a delightful 30-minute conversation, which we had on the phone with him. He was a real down-to-earth guy. And uh, the thing I liked most about him was that he didn't try to inflate his importance in the Beatles. He's proud of the time that he was with them. He didn't try to live off of it. He didn't try to make a buck off of it. He lived his life as he planned to. And um, I would definitely recommend you're listening to this conversation. It's actually show number 50 and um, great guy to talk to. I thought it was a really wonderful interview. We talked about the material that the Beatles played at the time when he was with them. And it was very much kind of the same material that the Blackjacks were playing, 50s rock and roll. And, um, you know, Paul McCartney's often talked about how the Beatles tried to make themselves different by playing more obscure songs and B-sides and stuff like that. She doesn't really bring that up. I think most of what they played, certainly at that time, um, might have been the more big hits from the 50s rockers, Chuck Berry, Little Richard, you name it, Jerry Lee Lewis, those people. So if you can, please check out that interview that Steve Marinucci and I did uh, back in 2013. And actually, thanks to Jim Birkenstad, who helped us get that interview, because Chaz did the foreword for Jim's book on Jimmy Nickel, to see the parallel of what it was like to be a Beatle for a very short period of time, as only Jimmy would know, and Chaz. And of course, the legend Tina Turner passed away on May the 24th. Certainly a great singer and performer either with her husband Ike and certainly as a solo artist, she covered uh, many Beatles songs, including Come Together, which Ike and Tina released as a single, Let It Be, Hey Jude, Something, She Came In Through the Bathroom Window, With a Little Help From My Friends, and Get Back. Now, as far as Get Back is concerned, I hope we all remember, Tina Turner performed Get Back with Paul McCartney at the Princess Trust Charity Show in 1986, when there was an amazing band on stage for that song that included Elton John, Eric Clapton, Phil Collins, Brian Adams, Paul Young, and others. And on her highly successful 1984 album, Private Dancer, she also covered Help. Definitely one of the most amazing dynamic performers of our time. Tina Turner was 83. And actually, as we're doing this newscast here, we're learning of the passing of Dan Mantovina. And Dan was the author of a book on Badfinger called Without You, The Tragic Story of Badfinger. As we learn more about this, we'll relay it to you, uh, possibly in our next show. But Dan also has been involved with um, compilations on Badfinger and um more recently, the the two releases, the the demos of Pete Ham, and the um, the compilation of various artists covering Badfinger music. Very sad news to hear in the Badfinger community. And so, as we hear more, we'll we'll let you guys know about it. I just um, I just was um, well chatting on Messenger via Facebook 
with Dan. Um, the date on this is May 21st. So it was about a few weeks ago uh -huh. about a, um, a new, there is a new Pete Ham collection, which oh, is a digitally only. Yeah. And I have reached out to him about the possibilities of it coming out, um, you know, like on CD or vinyl. And he basically said he didn't think so. He would love it, but he didn't think so. And we just had a little, you know, bad little pleasantries after beyond that. But mm. uh, yeah, this literally popped in as we were, you know, just the past 10 minutes while we're doing this. So, yeah, I know I mentioned uh, both of those Badfinger releases, the Badfinger and the Pete Ham release in our last show. But um, right, right, right. I'll right. find the information about it as as we're continuing. Right. There were two. The Pete Ham one is a double CD and it is on a physical disc y and t music they uh, were kind enough to send me a copy just the other day this <clears throat> excuse me was another collection of i did believe the pete ham demos this one's digital yes. only and i reached out to dan like i say in a few weeks ago about the possibilities of it coming out yeah uh, the pete ham demos is called misunderstood that's correct yes and um, it is strictly digital right now it's through distro kid and there's also the double CD honoring uh, Pete Ham and Badfinger called Shine On, a tribute right. to Pete Ham on Y&T Records. Right. And that's 35 tracks altogether. Right. Yeah, that's I just got that. I haven't heard listened to it yet, but I just got that the other day. So, but anyway, very sad news. Indeed. Okay. That's, that's all the news we do have. Okay. So on to our little 81st birthday celebration for Paul McCartney. Um, it, it is kind of an eccentric idea to try and choose one track for each of the decades. As we each found out when we tried to do it, it's really difficult. Um, so, um, you know, just keep in mind that that was the ground rule mm. so that you can refrain from saying i can't believe you neglected to include this track <laughs> because we only had one track for a decade decade this was impossible i have a couple extra each decade but i won't elaborate i'll just mention titles yep um but i think i was able to narrow it down to like the one i would say that's it this, well, sometimes when you do lists like thing. this, yeah. when when you do lists where it's a very limited number of songs, I know Alan seems to think that it's much more challenging and interesting in that regard. If, you, if you're pinned up against the wall and you had to put together a compilation of 15 of McCartney's best, there has entire catalog and there's so many great songs. I'm just saying any number, like mm -hmm. if it was 10 you know, it's just so impossible because you're going to leave out so much. But um, we're just doing this for fun. Yeah. You know, to honor Paul's birthday. And, you know, I mean, I, I'm a little used to this because in my former day job, it used to be, um, you you know, you have you have 500 words to write about this topic that you really want to address in 10,000 words. Uh -huh. so I'm used to throwing out stuff. <laughs> So, but let's start with Ken. Okay, so are we going to do this? We're each going to take a turn with with yeah. each decade. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, we'll go. You go through the. Are you want me to do each decade. decade all at once? Yeah, I think so because otherwise it will take forever. All right. <laughs> all right. For the sixties, oh my God, you talk about difficult. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, to start with. <sighs> I picked Hey Jude. And sometimes I, I really don't like being predictable because Hey Jude was the Beatles' biggest hit here in the United States, number one for nine weeks. But it's such an amazing song and recording, you know, and apart from just the melody and Paul's incredible vocals and how he screams at the end and you have that long coda and the fact that, it, you know, it shouldn't really matter that it was unique for its time because it was over seven minutes long for a single, but it was very unusual. Um, most singles were two to three minutes long, 
there are the exceptions. Hey Jude, MacArthur Park, Like a Rolling Stone. Some of those songs were fairly long. But I love everything about Hey Jude, uh, especially uh, not only the fact that even though I'm basically a melody guy first, if you've got a great melody with really strong lyrics to go with it, it makes it even a uh, stronger song, obviously. And I like the fact that this song is is about taking a positive look at something and, and improving a bad situation. So when you're looking at lyrics like, and anytime you feel the pain, hey Jude, refrain, right. don't carry the world upon your shoulders. For well, you know that it's a fool who plays a cool by making his world a little colder. And you can also say this is about a guy addressing this about his woman. Go out and get her. Remember to let her into your heart. Then you can start to make it better. Or you're waiting for someone to perform with. Um, these are fantastic lyrics here. Um, Paul's always been, for the most part, a very positive person. And there's a very positive message throughout this song. And even the line that he was questioning that he turned to John for the movement you need is on your shoulder is really a very interesting, you could call it a brilliant line. To me, that just means the responsibility is on your shoulder. You know, it's all on you. So um, I love the song for so many reasons, but it's such a perfect record. And despite the fact that, you know, when it comes to long songs, they demand a lot of attention and a lot of patience sometimes, because sometimes I'm not in the mood to hear a long song. And and even though Hey Jude is seven minutes and 11 seconds, I never get tired of hearing of it. I, I was going to suggest you could always put on the 20 greatest hits version. <laughs> okay. But I, I don't tire of it. The full version there. But Hey Jude and, and come on. You got Let It Be, you got Eleanor Rigby, you got Yesterday. There's so many great songs that Paul did in his Beatle days. How do you pick? I could just as easily have said Eleanor Rigby or Let It Be um, or Here, There and Everywhere, which I think is the perfect uh, love song. Um, but I picked Hey Jude. Again, a year from now, I might say something different, but uh, Hey Jude has been my favorite Beatles song for a very long time. 70s now there's a difference between favorite and best i can't ignore how most people vote maybe i'm amazed as being paul's possibly best song in his entire solo career and it is a great song but my favorite of the 70s is still 1985 i think it's one of the great album closers of all time i love the piano part and how everything builds around it um, it's as catchy as could be. His vocals are amazing. I love how it ends and comes back to Ben on the run. Just kind of like, you know, bringing back Sgt. Pepper as they did on the Beatles album. Um, and I was so happy when he started to, to add it to his set list. It's a great live song. It's, um, it's so perfect, <laughs> just the way that it is. An amazing melody. And it just flows in a way where everything sounds natural. It's exactly how it should be. I love the the slowing down of the song and picking it back up at the regular tempo. I love the whole arrangement of it. So I would pick 1985. Although backseat of my car is getting way up there on the list. <laughs> it's really hard to not mention a few other songs, but... Yeah. Um, yeah uh, there's so many great ones in every decade um the one from the 80s that i'm probably alone in this but um whenever i mention my top two favorite solo mccartney songs it's always 1985 and only love remains mm -hmm. only love remains is quite possibly the best love song that paul's done in his solo career um, although maybe i'm amazed could be certainly considered a love song um Great melody, great vocals. Well, you could say that about all these songs when it comes to Paul about the vocals. Um, but I especially love the lyrics of this song. Um, just the whole fact that when you're dealing with a relationship, the most important thing is that no matter what you're going through in life, the one thing that stays with you is that there's love between the two people. And I love the bridge and the words in the bridge, which I'll read here. 
old enough and strong enough to stretch across the world, taking the sand inside an oyster, changing it into a pearl, making another magic transformation, find the right boy for the right girl. And then the last verse, when all our friends have gone uh, away and we're alone, there's nothing left to shout about. Together we'll explore the great unknown. And I'd say we won't be going out tonight. Let tonight be the one that we remember when love is all that stays, only love remains. There are certain songs where Paul uses the trick, and he certainly did not invent this, of building on a song. And the last verse will sing uh, notes in a higher register, and it makes it even stronger. And driving home the message of the song more effectively when you do that. His vocals throughout the whole song, especially towards the end when he's singing those high notes, you know, when love is all that stays, only love remains. It's it's an amazing song, amazing recording, the instrumentation, the whole arrangement. It's as perfect a love song as you can get. But he's done a lot of great love songs <laughs> his entire career. So that's what I would pick. If you guys want to make a comment about any of these choices of mine, you can tell me. Yeah, it's a good choice. Yeah. I think, you know, one of the one of the reasons that when we were talking about, you know, not doing second choices and alternates and all that is because um, this particular topic and the way it's been set up almost guarantees that the three of us will have different lists, you know, because only being able to choose one. What are the odds that, you know, uh, that, that we'll duplicate each other a lot? And then that means that the people listening will have three completely different lists of one song per decade. And, uh, you know. Well, well, we'll we'll see. But I also know, Alan, that see. you don't like to repeat a song that the others of us have chosen <laughs> to the point where you might change it in the middle right. of the show. But you also don't like to choose something that, is too typical or what's expected like i'm curious to find out if you're going to put maybe i'm amazed in there because i think a lot of people would just expect us to all say maybe i'm amazed but we'll see so speaking of love songs let me cross that off but no i'm kidding <laughs> um for the nice. 90s i picked some days Good pick. which is a stunning love song and just like what I said about Only Love Remains, great lyrics, great vocals. I love the instrumentation, the acoustic guitar approach of the whole song. Um, and George Martin had to do with the arrangement. And I believe there's a harp in there, which is extremely effective. But, um, you know, sometimes the genius of, of Paul is that he'll recognize the simplest idea, something that we can all relate to, and... We, we can all just understand where he's coming from. Like like Paul would find fascination in, in watching a bird fly, something like that. And then he'll write about it. And that's part of the beauty of following Paul. It's the wonderment of life and all the things that he finds fascinating that are just common things that we we experience every single day. The way he likes to write about the working girl in another day, that kind of thing everyday life but if you look at the song like some days just uh, listen to the lyrics some days i look i look at you with eyes that shine some days i don't i don't believe that you are mine have you ever looked at your 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 spouse and looked at them and said this is, this is amazing i can't believe you're mine a simple idea like that um it's no good asking me what time of day it is who won the match or scored the goal some days i look some days i look into your soul Sometimes I laugh. I laugh to think how young we were. Sometimes it's hard. It's hard to know which way to turn. We don't need anybody else to tell us what is real. Inside each one of us is love, and we know how it feels. Those are just wonderful sentiments. The whole bit about, uh, I laugh to think about how young we were. He could be reflecting. Well, at least he wrote this just around the time when Linda was about to die hmm. as well. But he had 30 years with Linda. So he could be looking back to the very start of it all and how young they were. And as we all get older, we can be thinking about that. Very simple ideas, but extremely effective. So that's the song that I picked there from the 90s. And trust me when I say this, there's so many songs that I love from each decade. It's very tough to do this. I tried to do this with the approach of 
without looking at every single title on every album and look at every single and every B-side, what immediately comes to my brain without thinking about it? What do I turn to the most? What songs do I put on instantly without having to think about it that I really want to hear that really affect me? And so Some Days is one of those songs, just like Only Love Remains is. But when you talk about really powerful and those songs are powerful, one of the songs that has impressed me, I think it's probably his best song of this millennium is The End of the End. Yeah, That's my, my song for the 2000s. And um, I think we've talked about the song here on the show. Not a very pleasant topic to talk about, Paul looking at his own mortality. But um, it's just this whole idea, as Paul explained it when he went to an Irish wake, that people there were celebrating life and not mourning death and having laughs and, you know, enjoying themselves. Um, so what he wrote here was... Um, and this is the, the repeated verse at the end of the end, it's the start of a journey to a much better place. And this wasn't bad. So a much better place would have to be special. No need to be sad. And for people that think that Paul doesn't write great lyrics, you should definitely pay attention to the end of the end because I, the words, what's that? No, no, finish. I didn't mean to interrupt. Oh. Yeah. The, the words flow like poetry and there are certain things where I know Paul put out his book of lyrics and he also put out Blackbird singing as well with, um, you know, poetry for uh, poems that he didn't use in songs. But when you think about the images that he's putting into the words here and how they flow um, as you're reading it uh, on the day that I die, I'd like jokes to be told and stories of old to be rolled out like carpets. The children have played on and laid on while listening to stories of old. On the day that I die, I'd like bells to be rung and songs that were sung to be hung out like blankets that lovers have played on and laid on while listening to songs that were sung. Those are lyrics that could stand as poetry just by itself without ever having a melody. And it is a beautiful melody too. And what makes it even more effective is that it's basically Paul and a piano and there's some orchestration which I believe is probably from the keyboard and he whistles towards the end you know for someone who made a big deal out of not wanting the long and winding road to be so heavily produced as the Beatles version was this is Paul stripped down to just him and a piano for the most part and and saying beautiful words about how he'd like the world to treat when that time comes and, you know, takes a lot of guts to talk about that. So I'm so impressed with that particular song. It's not only the best song of his of the millennium. Um, it's definitely one of the best from his solo career. I, you know? What I was going to jump in before and say is I can't listen to that song. Mm. It's that powerful. It's upset. It really upsets me. Right. It's, pretty, it's a very sad song. Uh, I know that wasn't necessarily the goal. <laughs> But boy, did he hit it out of the park when it came to that. And um, I, I almost picked that. Me too. Yeah. Mm. And, and also, um, this doesn't benefit the song. But even if you're in a Paul McCartney tribute band, that's not a song that you would do. Because that's a song that's just personal for him. Mm -hmm. It's not a universal song. It's It's not a... It's not an all you need is love <laughs> type song. It's just him talking about you know, how he'd want the world to react when that day comes. Right. So when it comes to, what do you call it, the tweens? <laughs> that was also very difficult for me. Well, I tend to go a lot towards the ballads. Um, only Our Hearts would be way up there, because as much as I love my Valentine, I think that second ballad from Kisses on the Bottom, I think is really powerful, a great love song. But you know something, as, as much as I like the new album and yeah, um, uh, what I would, the, the songs that I kind of treasure the most are the songs that he wrote for films. And they, he just releases them individually. They go out digitally and the fans find out about it and they some of them like it, 
but I really think he puts a lot of effort behind those songs. Um, so there's, I want to come home, which I love a lot. And in the blink of an eye, which I love a lot, but I probably think hope for the future would be my favorite song uh, of that decade because of the message in the song. It's a great melody. And again, positive message coming from, from Paul. I'm glad that he chose to do that song live. I just wish he'd bring it back if he does choose to go and tour again. But I love the lyrics. They're simple, but uh, some hope for the future, some wait for the call to say that the days ahead will be the best of all. We will build bridges up to the sky, heavenly light surrounding you and I. From out of the darkness, our future will come. If we leave the past behind, we'll fly beyond the sun. We'll be together, sharing the load, watching in wonder as our lives unfold. Hope for the future, it's coming soon enough. How much can we achieve? Hope for the future, it will belong to us if we believe. Again, those stand as lyrics just by them by themselves. That could be a poem, you know. And I love the whole production. That's a very produced song with a lot of brass and orchestration. And Giles Martin worked on that. So there's the opposite production wise from the end of the end, you know, I so when he's when he's on, when it comes to writing lyrics, uh -huh. I think, I mean, you realize how fantastic he is at it so that when he does write something that maybe is intentionally meant to be lightweight or, you know, like for you, uh -huh. I think we re we tend to react because we know what we have heard. And we know what he's capable of. And, and I know Egypt Station tended to be an album where, it, to me, it felt like he wasn't bothering too much with the lyrics here. This was not going to be a deep record. I don't think he, he probably didn't go into that, to the process of making the album thinking that way. It just turned out that way. But even looking at the titles, it was so simple and basic on mm -hmm. Egypt Station that I found that I reacted like, oh, come on, Paul. Oh, or or song like, come on, people. That's a rallying call, come on, people. Because mm. he's written these other things that are like, holy mackerel, is that a great lyric? You know? I, yeah, but if you look at all the lyrics of come on, people, I think that they're kind of strong. Come on, people, let the, let the fun begin. We got it, future, and it's charging in. You know, I I like the lyrics of that song. I wish he could have done more than, oh, yeah, repeating that after it. But, you know, the rest of the lyrics I like for Come On People. But anyway, the point that I wanted to make there was whether it's Egypt Station or New, I like just about all the songs on both those albums. But it's not as if I pick one and say, oh, this is far and above everything else that's on the album. It doesn't stand out. Despite the fact that I like all the songs. Mm -hmm. I could say I love Domino's. That could be my favorite song on, on Egypt Station. Or I don't know. Or do it now. But I wouldn't say it's the best of the decade. Right. But I think when he takes the time and he's asked to write a movie song, like Live and Let Die, although Spies Like Us is in another category. I love the song, but, you know. <laughs> um, it's a fun track, Spies Like Us. It's not, you know, as great a song as Live and Let Die. But, um... I think he puts a lot of effort when he's asked to write one song for a project for a film, or in this case, with Hope for the Future for a video game. So it was very tough for me to pick something from from the the tweens. It's the whole practice, the whole exercise I found difficult. And actually, the easiest decades were the more recent ones for me. So it was the exact opposite. Okay. Now, I know Darren was questioning... Uh, are we going to treat McCartney three as though it's the twenties? It's the only work we have. Yeah, Paul, I ended really. up separating. I ended up separating them. It allowed me to pick something from McCartney two, and also, um, you know, one that actually was from the tens. So I separated them. Okay, so, so then I'll pick one from McCartney three. Okay, and, and that wasn't easy because again, I like all the songs on there, but. Which which one really stands out above all the others? Um, I probably would go with Women and Wives. 
I do like that song a lot because it has a gospel feel to it. He sings in a lower register, which doesn't bother me <laughs> at all. I like uh, the lyrics of Women and Wives. Um, hear me, women and wives. Hear me, husband and lovers. What we do with our lives seems to matter to others. Some of them may follow. Roads that we run down. Chasing tomorrow. Uh, many choices to make. Many chains to unravel. Every path that we take makes it harder to travel. Laughter turned to sorrow. Doesn't get me down. Chasing tomorrow. This whole idea of, you know, we are the parents here. We're setting an example. People are paying attention to us. We're an influence. You know, we're responsible in some way in that uh, in that regard. But um, I, I, I love when Paul does something that's sort of gospely and preachy in this regard. Kind of like, well, let it be that day is done is very gospely to me. And, um, you know, I pick that one. But sometimes I might go with seize the day. <laughs> and I love Deep Deep Feeling only because of the complexity of the song and all the different melodies that are interwoven, which is a McCartney gift. Yeah. Um, but for right now, I'm I'm picking Women and Wives. So those were my favorites of each decade. Okay. Very good choices. As of today. Uh, yeah, it went. <laughs> Actually, I'm looking at you and I'm going, he's changing his mind as we speak. No. <laughs> no, I I, def I wrote these down and I said, I'm sticking with it. <laughs> okay. Now, is it my turn? Yep. Uh, I Now I have to hopefully be able to make sense of this. <laughs> because there's lots of arrows and cross outs and rewrites and white out tape. Uh, the 60s were a virtual. <laughs> Why? You still use white out. I happen to not like errors. Thank you very much. No, <laughs> white out tape. You know, you in tribute to Mike Nesmith. He has to. No, I don't use the liquid white out. Okay. White I'm out sorry. tape. Okay. What sort of white out tape are you not getting here? Okay, uh, I understand. I didn't hear the tape. I didn't hear the tape. Yeah. You want to have some fun with somebody? Give the. I've I've also seen uh like a ta uh, an adhesive in that. It's not very doesn't isn't really strong. Give someone that and say here's the white out and have them glue their papers. Mm -hmm. Anyway, sorry. Uh, the sixties are virtually impossible for me to pick one. Uh, but the first song that popped into my head, and then I thought, yeah, but is this the one I want to go with? What about Eleanor Rigby? What about Let It Be? Well, that's the seventies. Um, well, I went it was with, recorded in '69. Yeah, yeah. I I went with for no one mm, okay. as my McCartney choice for the '60s, um, because I, for no one has you know that. I think it's got a very lack of a better way of putting a very similar clout that Eleanor Rigby are here, there, and everywhere come. And I remember when I was hearing a lot of the deep album tracks of the Beatles in the 70s. And we've talked about this a lot, how for me, you know, it was Wings first. They were coming. They were the current act. They were the hmm. current band you know, over the course of the 70s, especially in the middle 70s. I was learning gradually about what the Beatles had done and songs that I wasn't quite familiar with uh, from getting, you know, usually as gifts albums in no particular order and i remember hearing for no one um could it have been on love songs it was on love songs all right it probably was when i got the love songs album i heard for no one and you know i'm a young kid and lyrics didn't necessarily resonate like they can now hmm. but it that song jumped at me even as a 12 year old you know hearing it for the first time and that stuck with me that for no one is like that sleeper. Uh, I'll follow the sun's another one for me mm. for some reason that, you know, really is it like a deep cut that you don't necessarily think of right away that holds up, I think, with the ones that were, you know, the classics that everyone knows, Eleanor Rigby, blah, blah, mm. blah. So I'll go with for no one is my McCartney song for the 60s. The 70s, again, I was like, I, should I do this? Should I pick that? Maybe I'm amazed. I think might that that actually I would think might be the quintessential McCartney song for the '70s. But is that what we're trying to do here? Are we doing favorites? You know what I mean? Is it the best? 
No, you know? like we're supposed to be doing favorites. Yeah, is it quintessential? I, you, but I would find myself getting mixed up as I'm trying to choose. Mm. Wait, no, don't think in terms of. So I went with. The, I ultimately went with the tried and true, little lamb dragonfly for the seventies, uh-huh. uh, because when all is said and done, if there's one song I think that we might always heap boatloads of praise upon, it's that song. Mm. In recent shows, talking about. Red Rose Speedway and the wing stuff that we've been talking about, that always seems to come up front and center. I was tempted to try to overlook it and go to Wanton. That would be my runner up. But I thought, why? It's, you know, uh-huh. it, you know, it, it, it packs a punch. I could hear it being or parts of it being weaved in within the stuff on Abbey Road. You know, uh, another song that I like a lot from, from, uh, from a similar period because it's on band on the run is no words but i can't you know i'm thinking to myself no there's something about little lamb dragonfly that's mm. a little extra special and very mccartney so i uh, was i just wanted to say because uh in, in one of the threads on facebook i forget <laughs> which one um yeah one of our listeners posted little land dragonfly and called it a masterpiece and everything and i had written imagine if paul had done little lamb dragonfly during wings over america as part of his acoustic set hmm. do you know how nice that would, yeah how great that would have come out you know blackbird yesterday little lamb dragonfly you know as a as a melody writer i think yeah. is when he's on he has no peers and and the ability to interlock melodies and had taken mm. you know pieces and that's what little m dragonfly you know is a couple of different but pieced them in such a way they're like wow right I, what made you think of that mm. uh so that i ended up going with the with the with the for me is a safe and common 70s song but there's no denying it's when all is said and done it's my favorite probably of the wings period uh, only Love Remains did cross my mind. We've talked about, we did a show, I think, when we talked about a great final songs on McCartney albums, album closers. Well, and that that closed side one, not side two. That's why I didn't bring it up in that show. <laughs> but um, um, it might have been a show where we did talk about love songs, ballads, because uh-huh. we did both go on and on about Only Love Remains on an older show from maybe a couple of years back. Maybe we were talking ballads, possibly. Okay. Um, uh, I found the 80s hard. Maybe the hardest decade for me. Um, because, you know, there was... I'm, I've said this before. I'm not the biggest tug-of-war fan. Uh, and to me, the tug-of-war pipes of peace, give my regards to Broad Street era, the first half of the 80s excluding McCartney too, because I think that stands on its own. It's it's its own little beast. But those mm-hmm. other three albums to me were uh, he his his songwriting abilities was still at a height, but I didn't like what he was writing. I didn't like that that ballady soft pop stuff that was th- that phase that he ended up going into. And that's why I like Pipes of uh, Press to Play so much, mm. because I felt that broke him out of that safe um light rock phase right um so when picking an 80s song i went right i went through um press to play and i thought now you know what is um it's 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 a song from figure uh, from uh from flowers in the dirt and it's i went with figure of eight the the non-album version the version it's a little more crunchier that came out as a like an extra yeah, the Bob Clear Mountain mix. Was it? Was it? No, no, I don't remember. I used to know all of this inside and out. That was the single. Yes, okay. and it didn't do very well. But it was, it was much edgier than the album I ne- version. I nearly picked my brave face, also. Um, but in this case, um, uh, it was um. Sorry, I lost my I lost my page in this mess of notes. I lost my place here. Figure of Eight ultimately ended up being. I remember it. It it, it became my favorite song on Flowers in the Dirt. And as much as I like Press to Play, I could understand 
those who don't like it. I can understand why they don't. Hmm. The Flowers in the Dirt, I thought, played better as an album from start to finish. It did for me what Tug of War did for so many people. Um, into the 90s we go, and uh, Chaos and Creation in the Backyard, comp- I had the whole album picked at one time. Um, that no, that's the zeros. I'm sorry, I'm jumping ahead here. I got to make better notes. Oh, that's right. That's 2000. Sorry, oh, yeah, that's the way I'm reading this. All right, now that we're into the 90s, and I was going back and forth with tracks from Flaming Pie, Beautiful Night, Calico Skies, Little Willow. And then all of a sudden, Golden Earth Girl popped into my head. Hmm. A song that I don't think I liked when Off the Ground first came out. Uh, but and over time, um, you know, why why does this happen? You've, we've all have songs that click for some reason years later. We didn't hear what we hear now. Mm-hmm. And Golden Earth Girl, which which has that kind of that sort of wings thing happening in it. Mm-hmm. The piano bits very maybe I'm amazed. Um, right? Is that the Golden Earth? Yeah, the beginning of Golden Earth. That's yeah, the piano intro. Yeah. <clears throat> so I said, you know, to be different from my ni- 90s pick, I'm going to go with Golden Earth Girl. Mm-hmm. Um, I also wanted to pick one of his covers on Run Devil Run, but I thought let's keep it to original material because I really like some of the really heavy rockers on Run Devil Run. Mm-hmm. Um, so my 90s pick uh, is... Um, Golden Earth Girl from Off the Ground, uh, which is a which is a weird album for me because when it when I listen to individual tracks from that album, I like it a lot. Mm-hmm. But for some reason, listening to it as a whole, to me, it just plays like a little bit of a poor man's Flowers in the Dirt or a, a, an attempt at redoing Flowers in the Dirt. But I love some of those songs individually that are on that album, and Off the Ground is one of my favorite. Uh, that was another candidate that one of my favorite kind of more upbeat McCartney songs, later period McCartney songs. Mm. Into the 2000s. And I think I ultimately went with, let me just kind of go up to solely scribbles over. I think I settled on too much rain <laughs> from chaos and creation in the backyard. Great choice. <clears throat> and you know the world tonight writing to vanity fair that i think writing to vanity fair was my first favorite from chaos when that first came out mm-hmm. um but that was an album that was it's a perfect example of an album i needed to hear a few times and you know maybe the third or fourth listen the heavens opened knocking my microphone over the heavens opened and you know it and it and it was good i it all clicked i didn't hear it whatever it is the first couple of times i played it Hmm. it didn't help that the very first listen i still remember this i was dying to hear the album it was late and i thought let me put this i think someone i had a burn of the album i don't even remember where i got it from i played it on my clock radio i laid in bed you know, and of course, mm-hmm. I don't want to wake up my wife, so it's like barely audible. So I'm listening, going, oh, "This is very can't make out so mellow. It's very." Lo-. And then I fell asleep, and <laughs> I'll never forget that. I was going, "What are you doing?" So uh, there's my pick there. Too much rain uh, from Chaos and Creation in the backyard. Uh, I'm also very. F- um, particular to only mama knows on memory almost full i think that's one of his another one of his great late period rock songs Mm -hmm. but very um, wing sounding yeah but uh i flipped the coin and too much rain won Mm -hmm. uh bringing us into the tens now and because i decided let's separate mccartney three and put it in as a 20s um i chose uh i don't know from egypt station okay as my pick for the tens, um, Queenie I a close second, um, and uh, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Struck me as a song that could have, could have been on Chaos. I think 
it had that very uh, cerebral thing to it. Um, and one of the few songs that on Egypt Station that I gravitated to immediately. I'm still sort of trying to figure out what I think of both New and Egypt Station. You know, because sometimes I'll listen to those albums and really like them, and other times go, boy, these are just, they meander these songs. I hmm. can't make up my mind, you know, but I don't know is, is an immediate from Egypt Station that I thought that was a special song. And Find My Way from the 20s, hmm. from, from McCartney 3. So it's my favorite song on McCartney 3. That was easy then, you know. Um, an album that I find, what well, little discussion is that involves McCartney 3, I find, and I could be wrong about this, that it has not held up with McCartney fans who seem to dismiss it now. Uh, and yet I, for some reason, like McCartney 3, and I couldn't tell you why, more than I like Egypt Station and New. Yeah, I do too. Yeah. And I, yet I don't exactly know why that is. It was just something about just the overall feel, the vibe I get off the album. Mm-hmm. It could why. be something to do with, you know, Paul has a sound of his own when he produces himself. And a lot of people prefer that to when he works with producers or, you know, the hot producer of the time. So, you know, there are people that admire him for when he does choose to work with contemporary producers that he, where he admires his work. This, this goes all the way back to, yeah. you know, Hugh Padgham and, John Jelly Bean Benitez. <laughs> well, uh, I don't like. I mean, I was I was really glad that he worked with who he worked with on new, especially uh-huh. new, because if I felt like this guy's not sitting back, he's not mailing it in, right? He's going out there and he's working with some of the young heavy hitters, even though maybe some of the music that they're producing that's current today. Uh, might not necessarily, or I might not want to hear McCartney do Adele sounding stuff. Uh-huh. Uh, but still, it was like it, Greg Kirsten, Mark Ronson, these are heavy hitters today. Right. Glad to see him working with them. But then when all was said and done, I'm like, but I don't really think I liked it, what they came out with, came up, up with. Okay. Uh, Nigel Godrich was different. I don't necessarily agree with the way he went about pushing McCartney in the direction he did, but damn with the results, the results there. He did the same thing, not to get off, off the McCartney topic, but very I'll try to keep it brief. Nigel Godrich did something similar with Roger Waters, producing Waters' last st- studio album. Mm. Waters, who's into, who's, you know, writes big, big things like The Wall, Godrich kept him in check. And the album, the last album he did is This was The Life We Really Want, I thought was great. But I kept thinking, yeah, but I think Roger would have went a little more ballistic here. And it would have been a great double album had Nigel Godrich not edited him and tried to keep him. Mm -hmm. And that's what that was Godrich's approach with chaos, you know. And again, I was like, "Ah, you got to let McCartney be McCartney. But damn. You got some heavy songs out of him there, however he did it. Yeah, when you tighten the reins, sometimes it can yield great results. And uh, and Paul is someone that likes the freedom to do what he wants to do, and he has right. he has incredible ideas all the time. So, yeah, on the one hand, I want to see Paul continue to work with different people that he's never worked with before, but I sure wouldn't mind if he brought back Nigel Godrich again. Yeah, I just got the impression that wasn't the greatest, but I could be wrong. Wasn't the greatest working partnership. Well, you know, the story is that they were having a conversation about something and and uh, Nigel didn't like the result of a certain song or something. I don't remember all the particulars, but Paul had said, well, how many number one songs have you written? You know, That's how a lot there, of his collaborations end. That, well, both would have valid arguments, I think. Right. Mm hmm. Because the number one, you know, when he's working with Nigel Godrich in the, you know, 2004, 2005, you know, the playing field's totally different now. Paul can't write a number one hit right now. Mm -hmm. Too much has changed. Right. Uh, So, yeah, Paul, you wrote all these number ones, but here we are now working on this record now 
you're right. not still thinking because it's different now. Right. You, you know, you wrote the number ones, but I know what, you know, working with bands like Radiohead and Beck. Um, anyway. I know. And it's got to be difficult for any producer that works with Paul to try to say, you know, I know what's best here when he has this incredible history and track record. Right. How do you compete with that? Right. So. Okay. Great list. Thank you. <laughs> now it's time for Alan. Yeah. So um, <clears throat> you probably won't be surprised to hear that I found a way to cheat within the rules. <laughs> 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 and get an extra song for the 60s. Uh... By, by claiming that it was the 50s when he wrote When I'm 64 in 1956. But he only wrote the melody at the beginning. Okay, so well, we could switch to suicide if you prefer. <laughs> <laughs> well, when I'm 64 is a better choice. Yeah. Anyway, that, that was just sort of a throwaway semi-joke. Okay. Um, from the 60s, uh, I, I went with a fairly commonplace here, there, and everywhere. Although, for me, the big choice was between that and yesterday. I mean... Um, Although, you know, like you know, like we say, you know, th there are a million, there are a million songs. We could have done things we said today. You know, we never pick things we said today for anything <laughs> on this show, weirdly enough, you know. Um, we'll have to find a way. But, you know, here, there and everywhere and, and possibly also because, you know, the 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 remix of Revolver was was pretty recent. And in the course of that, in picking apart the 5.1 mixes, um, here, there, and everywhere, just the components of it, the the background vocals. It was just so stunning, you know. Um, but also, you know, uh, I think I think, you know, Paul himself rates it pretty highly. John rated it pretty highly. Um, so, yeah, you know, I don't think he had any bad Beatles tracks, you know. Um, but here, there, and everywhere is really up in the top 10 you know mm -hmm. so uh so that's for that uh 70s 70s you know <laughs> again was tough especially seeing i've been immersed in his 70s work for the last several years um and every time you know when when i've done interviews about the book people have said can you pick one track and you know i've i've pretty much always picked uh backseat of my car cuz it's just so brilliant so i thought mm. i wouldn't do that this time um just you know to give uh listeners looking for some tracks to play some variety um so i picked picasso's last words which is probably not the most intuitive thing almost did 1985 um, the reason I went with Picasso is because it's one of those tracks that once you start looking at it closely, there is such a ton of stuff in there, um, you know, and the story itself, you know, starting with uh, Dustin Hoffman showing him the Time Magazine -o bit of, of Picasso and saying, can you write a song about this? And and Paul just sort of picking up a guitar and doing it, you mm. know, which he can do. You know, it's almost a party trick for him. Um, so, but he he did it, and it turned out to be and 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 interestingly, the cassette Dustin Hoffman apparently recorded the evening, and um, and so there is the cassette with his sort of primordial uh, drink to me, drink to my health uh, part of of Picasso's last words. It also has. A, a number of other things on there, including um, getting closer, which is uh, didn't turn up until way later, uh, and and number of things. But anyway, then once they got into the studio, I mean, this was the last thing that they recorded in Lagos, um, and the one thing that they recorded at Ginger Baker Studio, and uh, you know they've all they 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 have. There's a section with shakers, and they went mm -hmm. out and picked up pebbles outside ginger studio put them in a container and shook them um they did uh they had effects tapes you know there's that there's that uh bbc french service tape yeah. 
um, that sort of comes in and out and uh, the sort of French cafe music, you know, just so mm. many elements, so many elements and, and writing about it and picking it apart was, excuse me, was really difficult because um, sometimes, you know, you're looking at the, the tracking notes and everything and you're trying to figure out how, how did they do that? You know, it, it almost doesn't make sense, you know, just because in terms of, of, um, you know, when something would have to come in and, uh, you know, trying to figure out what they did to make it work, the, the, the many sections of it, um, it just came together pretty brilliantly. Um, I've just been writing about the 76 tour where they played it live as an acoustic thing and, um, it's okay. The live. Yeah. It doesn't have. Yeah, it doesn't quite. No, it's just a shortened version of it. Doesn't have. <clears throat> yeah, and how could how could it have? And unless they did, unless they did a full band version with a lot of things like the French tape and everything on a sampler on on a keyboard and brought it in, it would be really really tough to do this live, uh, in in the way the studio version is. So anyway, I kind of thought here's a track that nobody's going to pick. <laughs> And, uh, you know, could use some recognition because it's, you know, it's really interesting. Um, 1980s, uh, I went with My Brave Face. Um, first of all, I like the energy of it. Um, has a, a good melody. You wouldn't think of it necessarily as a great McCartney melody, but it's really not bad if you listen to it, you know, just in melodic terms. It's got that uh, collaboration with Elvis, which is, you know, uh, always kind of, I think Elvis has this tough side that, uh, you know, worked well with McCartney. Um, and it's, you know, um, possibly is, you know, speaking as someone who has been married four times and therefore three divorces, uh, there's like a lot of good stuff in that song. You know, <laughs> I've been breaking up dirty dishes and just throwing them away. That's brilliant. <laughs> I wish I thought of that. Um, anyway, so hmm. also, also like the video for it, you know, like the, you, you can't, it's not part of the song, the video and everything, but it's sort of hard to separate a lot of these things that, that were, you know, part of the initial listening experience to it. You know, the video came out pretty quickly, had this business of, uh, you know, Paul's memorabilia being stolen, his Sergeant Pepper suit, his bass, all that. Um, you know, as a an obsessive collector, it was kind of a fun video to watch. It didn't have anything to do with the song, but... You know, it was fun and the song was great. And it uh, also, I also like the, you know, the way it begins with that sort of, you know, acapella choral, you know, my brave, my brave, my brave. Yeah, yeah. Great. It's just great. Love that song. Um, 90s. Yeah, I almost picked some days. I'm glad I didn't because then I ha wouldn't, don't, would have had to change it. Because <laughs> um, mm -hmm. so far, I don't think we have any overlap, right? No. Nope. So I went with Little Willow. Um, a lot of great stuff on that album. I mean, after after some days, I went to Beautiful Night, and you know, like like uh, anyway, uh, like Darren said, pretty much followed the same path, but ended up on Little Willow because um, you know, this was a song written, I guess, about Maureen Starkey's death, and. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, Linda's is pretty close, you know, and, and it has to it, it it has to have resonated with him. You know, he's writing this song for Maureen, but he could be writing it for Linda, you know, um, it's it's a beautiful song. It's a, it's touching. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's sad. It's uh, so that's why I picked that basically. And again, you know, it's got that McCartney melodic sense and uh, um, beautiful arrangement too. So went with that. Let's see. That was the nineties. The nineties was actually pretty tough because um, there were a number of things. I mean, I, I kind of at the beginning thought I was going to do something from off the ground. Um, and there's a lot of stuff on off the ground. I like, 
but uh and then there were all the b-sides of singles from off the ground yeah. actually in the for 90s i i started before i got to some days i was gonna do looking for changes just because it's you know uh, uh sort of political uh activist kind of song mm -hmm. and you don't get an awful lot of that from paul you get some but um but that one is is one also that you know means a lot to him and meant a lot to linda so um was gonna do that but didn't anyway 2000s um i went with sing the changes does fireman count wow sure. yeah of course it counts yeah okay um it's lyrically you know you could make a case either that it's very poetic or that it is you know totally random and doesn't make sense in this case in the case of this song that doesn't even matter to me i just like the feel of the song um and you know the fact that he chose that song from that album to play live uh it sort of indicates that it that it connects for him too um you know and the lyrics are are kind of interesting um i'm not going to read them but you know maybe uh give it a play have a look at the lyrics and uh and and see what you make of it i i just think it's one of those tracks that's a little bit out there and uh like a lot of his fireman stuff is and i mean in a certain way this might even be the most commercial of his fireman things but that probably uh, is that, yeah. that song in particular yeah and they put it on the seven inch singles set so you know anyway mm. um so that's two thousands where am i no. 2010s thousand tens. okay <laughs> who cares from egypt <laughs> Station. really oh i just saw interesting <laughs> i thought you meant who cares <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah um you know who cares it's like uh it's it, it in a way you know you start listening to it and you think okay this is so so it's like a kid song right it's like to make a kid feel better about bullying or you know or whatever uh except that it's not it's not the kind of thing that you would tell a kid because the the refrain is you know uh who cares what the idiots say who cares what the idiots do you know who cares about the pain in the heart who cares about you i do um you know the the who cares about the who cares what the idiots say is like you know i don't know i kind of think if you're talking to a kid you'd probably be a little more i don't know parental <laughs> mm. i wouldn't know um but uh I just kind of uh, I just kind of like the idea that this is about, you know, on one hand, standing up to abuse that you're getting from someone else. But also that, you know, the end of the of the refrain, who cares about you? I do. It, it kind of is like, you know, you, you're, you're, you should stand up to people, not care what they have to say. But, you know, by the way, you, you know, you do have someone who cares about you. You know, uh, it just seemed like a nice message. And um, and also it was a, a good, again, a good feel. You know, when I'm working on the, the books, you know, a lot of times Paul talks about specific songs and especially ones where he has doubts about the lyrics or where the lyrics have been criticized he basically says, look, what's important to me is the feel. You know, he talks about feel all the time, you know, in interviews over the decades. Hmm. And if one thing this song has, it's feel, you know, the, starting with feedback and, the you know, really good instrumental textures and things. So that's my hmm. one for the 2010s. And since in the 2020s, we really pretty much have only McCartney 3 to deal with, um, which is an album I like a lot. Um, you know, again, that was the problem, you know, there was so many, like, um, so many tracks that it could have been. But I went with Seize the Day because I like, um, well, the feel of it for starts, um, <laughs> the 
the melody of the sort of you know middle section when the cold days come and i also like the lyrics of the middle section because he's he seems to be talking about sort of you know an, an, an ecological thing you know we're heading for a kind of disaster here uh when the cold days come and the old ways fade away there'll be no more sun and we'll wish that we had held on to the day seize the day you know he's talking about like almost an apocalyptic future and i took it to mean listening to the to the record as a, a sort of um ecological apocalypse not necessarily a war apocalypse um it just seems uh yeah like that so that was uh that was the 2020s brings us to date up to date so with no overlaps um we now have come up with what, like 21 songs you know that we that could be uh an interesting mccartney overview not necessarily the best of mccartney but really good mccartney some of which is sometimes overlooked and some of which isn't so that's our birthday tribute very interesting choices yeah. Alan. thank you, you know, i'm i must say with picasso's last words as someone who grew up on a lot of show music hmm. i see that there's a pattern there in that he brings back these other songs from Ben on the run, like he puts Jet back in there. Mm -hmm. And then towards the end, the ho, hey, ho from Mrs. Vanderbilt. That's the kind of thing that you do in, in show music very often. Right. And later on, uh, a later song towards the end, it's kind of like what you do in an overture, but towards the end of mm -hmm. a show. So makes me wonder if, uh, if we ever get to hear It's a Wonderful Life, <laughs> <laughs> if there'll be any of that in there. But uh, yeah, uh, it's it's really interesting, all the ideas that he put into Mrs. Vanderbilt there. Very interesting choice of yours. Thank you. Definitely. Yeah. There's so much great material to pick from. And if we do the same thing a year from now, we could have completely different choices. Oh, yeah. We do the same thing tomorrow. We could have... We'd have probably picked different songs. We could do the same thing a year from now, and the rule would be that we cannot include anything that any of us included the first time. Okay. Make sure I hold on to my notes. <laughs> well, I can't read them now. I'm going to read them in a year. <laughs> well, you could listen to the show again. <laughs> Happy birthday, Paul. Yeah. 80, yes. 80, 81 years young. You gave us so much great stuff, and Believe thanks for con for yes. continuing yes. to bring us more stuff. And yes. we're eagerly awaiting to hear about your next music project or release. <laughs> and, of course, the new book coming out right. tomorrow. Right. Eyes of the Storm. 1964, Eyes of the Storm. So That may be a candidate for a Father's Day gift for yours truly. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> if I could, you're dropping a hint to your family now. Or? If I can get anyone to acknowledge that they're related to me, but uh, you know. <laughs> who's this guy? All right. So, so should we go around and give our info? Let's go around. Around and around. Who goes for it, Aaron? Um. Yeah. Yeah. WFUV is where I'm at, and you can uh, listen. Monday through Thursday nights, uh, starting at 10 p.m. till 2 a.m. Uh, Eastern, uh, for those of you out of the, you know, in another time zone. Uh, and Saturdays also from 1 to 4 p.m. afternoons. So that's five days a week on WFUV at 90.7 FM. And you can also stream at WFUV.org or download our app and listen there. Um, so that's FUV. And if you want to get in touch with me directly, um facebook's the best place really uh i have two facebook pages um whichever one you stumble upon either send me a friend request or click like or follow or whatever it is and i'll get you onto the other page i'm trying to i i'm always trying to figure out ways to make one page a little more unique than the other and not repeat content so if you're on both then you know i try to make it so that it's worthwhile 
but I probably put way too much thought into what goes where. But so that's my thing. Next. Uh, is that me? Yes. I guess so. Okay. <laughs> uh, if you want to get in touch with me directly, my email address is every little thing at att.net. I also have a Facebook page with Ken Michaels. It's me with my very cute but late dog from the past, oh. Nilsson, who was named after Harry Nilsson, um, and friend me on there. Uh, my YouTube channel, which is called Ken Michaels Radio, uh, just recently I got together with the same three guys who are Bob Dylan experts, and we did a Bob Dylan and the Beatles show, part three of it, and uh, just talking about uh, the friendship and the work relationship and the many events and happenings between Dylan and the Beatles through the years. And we had Jeff Slate on the show, yeah. New York musician and music journalist, who's done a lot of incredible work, including he wrote a piece that was in the Sgt. Pepper archival box set. I mean, if I did that, I can I can die a happy man <laughs> if I contributed something that's in a Beatles yeah. box set. Um and uh yeah and he does lots of tribute shows in new york city on <clears throat> dylan on david bowie john lennon george harrison tom petty um and also dylan cv is on that show nashville musician who's been a guest on my channel and the two legs uh podcast and annie nichols speaking of two legs one of the two co-hosts along with tom and yadi so we talked a lot about bob dylan and the beatles we picked up where we left off in the previous show which was at the concert for Bangladesh. We took it all the way to the present. If you want to watch that, it's really in depth talking about everything that Dylan and the Beatles did together. Um, I also just did another ultimate Beatles trivia show with Andy Nichols, who's the reigning champ at the moment. Uh, Ken Womack was one of the three contestants on that show. We know him for the countless Beatle books that he's put out, including two upcoming books on Mal Evans, the first of which comes out in November. Um, and Scott O'Rourke was also one of the contestants. He does a Beatles show on WUSB, that's the University of Stony Brook on Long Island, um, every other Thursday. And uh, there are links to all all uh, the, the co-hosts and guests on my show that are in the description boxes uh, for my videos. So if you can, check those out. There'll be more interviews, more trivia shows to come. Uh, my other uh, podcast show, Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast. The most recent show that we did was for the 50th anniversary of Living in the Material World, which we just did on our show here. So you can hear what my other co-hosts, Kid O'Toole, Tom Hunyadi, and Joe Mayo had to say about that album. They will have a new show coming up. Uh, fairly soon, I believe next Monday, I'm actually going to be on vacation, so I'll miss that show. They're going to have two guests on the show who will be in the audience for the uh, McCartney interview with Conan O'Brien, so they, they can talk about that on that show. And I'm sure they're going to be talking about Paul's new book, as we will probably, <clears throat> I think, in our next show, should be. Um, and my syndicated radio show, Every Little Thing, if you want to hear it, the only way to listen to it on demand is on the website for WFDU. That's Fairly Dickinson University's website. Go to WFDU.FM. And all my shows, which normally run Sunday mornings at 6 a.m. Eastern time, they get put on the website. They're available for two weeks. So you actually have two shows you can listen to at any given time that stay on the website for two weeks. Whenever you want, WFDU.FM. Go to the archival shows. Type in every little thing. And you will see two shows there that you can play. And uh, then there's my website, KenMichaelsRadio.com, Beatles Trivia every single week. And you can win one of 10 incredible prizes, including the McCartney Legacy, Volume 1. Hopefully it'll just stay there. And then when Volume 2 comes out, that'll replace Volume 1. You know, want to make the McCartney Legacy just stay on the on the website, like indefinitely, I think. <laughs> Maybe that'll make Alan happy. Who okay. sees? Who yeah. says? <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> All right. Uh, I think that's everything. Well, you alluded to the fact that you're going on vacation. Yes. Which may very well mean there may be a gap in for our next show. Folks, Possibly. If you, don't, if you don't see us, we're here. Ken's going somewhere. 
exploring space and uh uh alan will be working hard on on the book and i'll be getting all kinds of aggravated with the mets and but we will be back i it, it, probably looking like early july right I mean, probably the second week of july i would think around right. july 10th yeah. so that's what i'm shooting for you probably won't you won't even remember that we're not around so but uh, anyway, enjoy your. I hope not. Enjoy, enjoy your <laughs> vacation. Back listen to the Chaz Newby show and yes, some of the you other. can catch up on shows you missed and other shows and Ken's other thingies and yeah, we're up to we're up to episode. This is three ninety two. So there's mm. yeah. there's three hundred ninety two. One other shows for you to listen to. Uh, yeah. Um. Have a good. Have a nice trip, Ken. Enjoy. Come back rested. Yeah, I will. I definitely will with a tan. Okay, so you can find me at on Facebook um, at either Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remixed. Um, there's also a McCartney Legacy Facebook page, and there is McCartneyLegacy.com. I think it's the McCartneyLegacy.com. And uh, we have here a uh, Twitter handle <laughs> at Things We Said Fab. You can email all of us. At things we said today radio show at gmail.com and we have two count them two facebook pages things we said today and things we said today beatles radio fans and um that basically does it for me so this was uh this was fun it was hard but it was fun and um you know we'll do something like it next year, probably. And probably maybe once or twice in between, we'll have things that are conceptually similar or something. Maybe not necessarily about Paul. Could be any of them. Yep. And if you and if you have any ideas for us, you can always write to us here. We have taken ideas from our listeners and viewers, and we yep. welcome anything, any idea you want to send to us. At things we said today, radio show at gmail.com. <laughs> Okay, so for Ken Michaels and Darren DeVivo, I'm Alan Cozen. Thank you so much for listening, and we'll see you next time. And happy birthday, Paul. Happy birthday, Paul. <laughs> <laughs>